Spare time has been in short supply lately, but the time I have had, I've been working on the setup to test DualSense replacement batteries. I thought to do it right, I need to charge the batteries like the DualSense charges them, and I need to at least come close to discharging them like the DualSense. This charge is going to be very dependent on how the controller is used, but for the first step, I need to measure what the DualSense is doing with the battery when it is charging and discharging. And I can't easily do that with the battery inside the controller. I had already found the battery connectors the DualSense uses. It's the JST brand ZH series connectors. The ZHR-3 is the connector on the battery leads, and a B3B-ZR-SM4-TF is the connector on the mainboard. What is nice, the headers come in through hole as well as SMD versions, and that makes life easier for me. What I'm going to do is drill a hole in the bottom cover and install a battery extension cable through it. I'll put some heat shrink on the wires to help keep them in place. These are 26 gauge wire, which is the largest wire listed for the crimp contacts for these connectors. This is where the through hole headers makes life easier. I'll solder the wires onto the header pins with the most important item being to get the wires on the correct terminal. I'll heat shrink it all up, the individual wires first, that way they can't short out, and then a piece of heat shrink over the entire connector. Hopefully this will give a bit of a strain relief. Even with me trying to be careful, this wire bundle is going to take a beating, but this will give me much quicker access to changing out batteries and test connections. From previous testing, I had some idea of the current that is pulled from the battery. With no rumble, and I believe the battery voltage here was a bit under 3.6 volts, this was averaging around 120 to 125 milliamps. With heavy rumble, this would saturate the current sense amp I was using, so it can pull over 350 milliamps, but I don't know how much more. What I need is long-term recording of the voltage and current through the battery. I'm not interested in the higher frequency components of this current waveform, but I do want some detail more than what a multimeter will supply. My plan is to record data at one millisecond intervals. With a little bit of filtering, I will pick up some of the spikes in the current draw, but most of the really high frequency stuff will get filtered out and hopefully end up with an average or a value very close to it. This is what I'm going to be measuring the current and voltage with. I'll call it the PM1. I've calibrated it with the meters I have, so accuracy will only be as good as that but I have compared the readings from it to the meters and scope, and it's right in line with them, so I think it's working pretty good. Good enough to give me some better insight into how the DualSense charges and discharges the battery. I do still have more work to do on it. There is more noise in the current measurement than I would like, but it seems to be random noise, so it shouldn't be a problem for this testing. There is a lot of data from the PM1. It sends a packet of data every five milliseconds a time value in milliseconds, and five current and five voltage readings. I do log the raw data coming into a file, and it looks like this. The first column is the time in milliseconds since the test started. The even columns are the current values in 100 microamps, and the remaining odd columns are the voltage values in millivolts, and each value pair are timed one millisecond apart. So all the data is here, but it's not very user friendly. I also have the recording of the PM1 user interface, a much more user-friendly representation of what's going on. The top three readings are quarter-second snapshots of the values. A block of 250 samples is averaged and displayed. The average milliwatt value is the moving average over two seconds. Well, 2,048 milliseconds to be exact. Makes the math easier. And the milliwatt hour value is the accumulated power since the test started. The voltage value is always positive, as the battery plugged up backwards would be a disaster. All the other readings can be positive or negative. Positive values will be power going into the battery, charging. Negative values will be power leaving the battery, discharging. The large blank window at the bottom will become a waveform graph at some point. There just hasn't been enough hours in the day. I also save a VCD file. When I get my graph display working, I will probably drop this. If someone knows of a good open source viewer and file format, please leave a comment, as the lack of a vertical scale in this leaves a lot to be desired. But it does work to show an overall picture of what is happening, and that is useful. This is about the last 98 minutes of the battery's charge, and I'm playing Borderlands 3 with the rumble set to default, 
which I'm pretty sure is maximum. The red graph is the voltage, and the drop of the line from the start to where the controller turns off represents right at 200 millivolts. The green graph is the current. The line doesn't look it, but it is slightly increasing. But what is noticeable is the very large current spikes for the rumble and controller feedback features. It is more than I expected, and quite a drain on the battery. The data in the VCD file is a little different than the log file. The data points I use in the VCD file are 5 millisecond average values. If I go back to the data log file, near the very end, close to controller cutoff, the current values are all over the place. And from the graph view, I know this is a heavy rumble section of time. One advantage the log file has, I can search it. So if I want to look for current entries that are between 600 and 699 milliamps, it is quite easy. There are not very many, but there are 1 millisecond intervals that are over 600 milliamps. And the maximum is 1 675.3 milliamp reading. That is a lot more current than I was expecting. And let me see if there are any 700 milliamp readings. Nope. So for over an hour, at the battery's lowest voltage output, which should make for the greatest current draw, 675 milliamps was the maximum. If I look for all the readings above the 500 milliamp value, there really isn't that many. 570 values out of a list of over 5.5 million? Okay, it is a very rare event for the controller to pull over 500 milliamps. I'll have to think about that, if I even want to implement that much of a current spike in my load test. The other important information I want to gather is the battery cutoff voltage. There were no 3.2 to 3.299 volt readings, but there are some readings in the 3.3 volt range, and quite a bunch of them right before the controller cuts off. I think that is a pretty good indication the battery cutoff voltage is 3.4 volts, so the controller is not taking the battery to 0% charge, which is good for the life of the battery. So this gives me two of the values I was looking for and a lot better understanding of the impact of the controller feedback functions. Emulating the battery discharge is really going to be picking a discharge profile and sticking to it. I do want to incorporate some of the controller feedback power draw, as I think most people will play with the feedback turned on. As the battery's efficiency will drop with increased current draw, the amount of higher current sections in the discharge profile will have an effect on the total power output the battery can deliver. I've got a lot to consider for how to implement the discharge profile. I started the charge cycle up about a half an hour after the discharge was complete. The controller off battery voltage has risen to 3.487 volts. The charge profile turned out to be a big surprise. The controller is plugged into a USB power supply with a USB A to C cable. And the charge cycle took a little over 5 hours. And it starts up supplying right at 500 milliamps to the battery kind of started as I would expect. Charging at around the 0.3C rate, I would expect the controller to expect up to 900 milliamps available at the USB port, and I did wonder if it might start charging it closer to the 0.5C rate, but I guess not. This is a new battery, but not an OEM. I'm still hunting for one of those. As time passes, current has crept up a few milliamps. I would expect that is from heating of the charge circuit components, and not some designed in function. Let me slow time back down to normal here. At this point, over an hour and 20 minutes into the charge cycle, I've put about 2.7 watt hours into the battery. Battery voltage is up to 3.951 volts, and my expectation was for it to continue like this until the battery voltage hits a maximum level, and then the current would start to fall. Well, that is not how it charges. Once it reached 3.951 volts for a bit, then the current drops to 400 milliamps. That was a surprise, but there is a pattern here. And as I speed through time and approach the hour 50 minute mark, battery voltage is right at 4.001 volts, and charge current drops another 100 milliamps. 50 millivolts of battery voltage, 100 milliamp drop in charge current, and the pattern will continue. Once the battery voltage hits 4.051 volts for a bit, have another 100 milliamp drop in charge current. So now charging at 200 milliamps. At about 3 hours 10 minutes, there is a slight break in the pattern, but possibly the break is because I'm not doing 500 microvolt resolution. The battery voltage doesn't get to 4.101 volts. After a bit at 4.100 volts, the current drops to 100 milliamps. 
At this point, over three hours in, the vast majority of the charge has been put into the battery. The last hour and a half have been spent at 100 milliamp charge current, and the battery voltage is hitting 4.150 volts. I believe it is at this point that a switch to constant voltage mode is made, as now the current is dropping as I would expect for CV mode. It's slow, and the battery voltage does continue to rise a bit. And for these batteries, a millivolt matters. I don't know if this final charge mode is really constant voltage. It's been in this mode for almost 30 minutes. And the current continues to fall, but the voltage has continued to rise. Battery voltage is now at 4.171 volts. Charge current, 57 milliamp. Very close to putting 100% charge in the battery. Without having the data sheet on the battery, I can't be sure. But for a rough guess, say 95% charge, maybe a bit less. The charge finally stops at the battery voltage of 4.171 volts and a charge current of 57.1 milliamp. The charge cycle is strange. I don't think I've ever seen a battery data sheet that recommended anything like this. If anyone has any thoughts on why the charge cycle is implemented this way, please leave a comment. Or if you know of a battery data sheet that describes this form of charge cycle, please point me in that direction. would be much appreciated. One last look at the charge cycle in chart form. I don't think it will be too hard to implement. The last part of the cycle doesn't really look like true constant voltage as the voltage rose 21 millivolts. That might be a bit tricky. I'll have to think about it. That being said, this is only one charge and one discharge cycle that I've looked at. I want to do this quite a few times. See what differences show up. I want to do it at different temperatures. I'm sure that will have some effect. And I want to test with different controllers. So there are a lot of hours of testing ahead. Thank you for watching.